evil, to be profoundly immoral and wicked. There are, on average, 1.3 million violent crimes in the U.S. annually, 800,000 assaults, 90,000 rapes, and 15 to 20,000 murders. Murderers are not monsters, they're men. And that's the most frightening thing about them. Alice Siebel. Megan, a licensed mental health professional, and her husband, Paul, a police officer, sit down to examine and discuss the nature, the impact, and most importantly, the origins of evil. Good evening, murderites. I'm Paul Braun. And I'm Megan Braun. And this is The Origins of Evil. That's right, a podcast about awful assholes annihilating the innocent and what makes them tick. Megan, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I'm definitely a touch tired. Work has been a little a little nuts lately. If I hear the word catalytic converter one more time, I, I don't even know what I'm going to do. It's, it's going to be drastic and it's going to be very sad for a lot of people. For those who don't know, uh, people are stealing catalytic converters at night, like 10 of them at a time. And it's a very annoying thing to deal with. And I know what that is. I hope no one steals my catalytic converter. They yeah. won't because I keep it very safe and hidden in the place where it belongs. Oh, well, we have an electric car, so we don't have a catalytic converter. There you go. See? All you have to do is kind of, you know, not have... An internal combustion engine? Yeah. It's yeah, that it, simple. Yeah. that's it. Just have a lot of disposable income and you'll be totally fine. Don't don't even worry about it, guys. Uh, no, but if you have a Honda CRV or a Cord, like, be careful because it takes like two minutes and they're cutting them bitches out and running away with them and selling them to a scrapyard. But that's just some real inside baseball cop bullshit that I'm sure maybe 2% of you care about. Uh, Megan, what have you been up to? What, if, what, what makes Megan Braun tick? What gets you out of bed in the morning beside our screaming son? Um, I mean, as you know, I've been researching this case very heavily for yes. this past month. Um, it's almost a problem. I like never feel ready to present because I really do try to dive very deep into the cases that I present, which is why like the Riley Fox case took a while to come out. And with this case, I was just like, but wait, there's more. There's more I have to add to it. And it just got to a point where I was like, okay, I can't think about this person anymore because oh no, I like not, I like him living in our in our head rent free. <laughs> it's great. Um, for those of us, for those of you rather who don't follow us on Instagram, you might be a little out of the loop as to why this episode is coming to you two weeks late. Well, first I'll hit you with the good news: you're actually getting two episodes this uh, this fine day. And we'll explain what the second one is going to be in a little bit. But um, I will just say that we had a scheduling, not a conflict, but just something that had to be taken into account. And uh, we ended up having to push the episode back a little bit to accommodate for this really cool opportunity that we had. So you'll be getting this episode and an additional almost hour of content That'll be a little different for us, but I think it will be exciting for for you guys. It was exciting for us, I, I think. Before we get into this episode, um, I did just want to uh, address something with the audience. Megan brought up the point that some of the research, we just frankly need more than the two weeks that are allotted for us to do these cases justice. If it If it comes down to putting an episode out on time... Or giving the case the time and the respect it deserves, we're going to go for the latter. But I also want to be able to maintain a consistent schedule for you guys because I think it's important. And, you know, it, this is a podcast that is meant to entertain and you guys should know when we're going to be putting out stuff. So we came up with an idea that we would basically have two, like, like a subclass of episode. Our standard numerical episodes where we do one case, go in super depth, Megan does her 
therapist thing. I do my cop thing and it's a great time. The new kind of episode that we have that we would want to do would be a shorter one. It'd be a little bit more bite sized and its structure would basically be that one of us would present a case that the other one would have no idea what it is. And it would typically be cases that just have less info out there, uh, less less resources in terms of the, the killer's psychology, stuff like that. Yeah, there's less psych info. Yeah. Maybe they're unsolved. Basically, like, we, we pass up doing a lot of cases because there's not enough information on there to do an hour and a half to two hour long show on them. So if this is something you guys would be interested in, doing like a 45 minute episode that's a little bit more bite sized a little bit lighter, easier to digest, uh, let us know because I think it would be something that we would be able to maintain doing in between these bigger cases. Yeah, and I think um, I think it's going to be really good, you know, to help get more episodes out there and so that we're more consistent because I am pretty much the one holding up. <laughs> any consistency or these episodes being released on time, especially when it's a psych heavy case. Um, no, that's on. my jam. I definitely so. shit the bed with the Vander Hyman case. I, I definitely was. I mean, you, it, that was one show you had to watch that was on in our living room. I think like every day for a few weeks. And I was like, well, what, what are you possibly missing from this one, one episode? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, to be fair, I was hospitalized cause I got into a fight with somebody also. Okay. That did happen. I know. I was on an injury. It was a whole thing. We talked about it in the episode, Megan. Okay. All right. Before we get started, uh, Paul, why don't you tell everyone the incredibly stupid thing you did at work? Oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> about that. So I was working um, like two weeks ago and got a call for a house fire. And like more often than not, it's not that big a deal. It's a smoke condition or it's something. It's whatever. Uh, and so it's like two 30 in the morning. And I of course happen to be two blocks away from where this house is. So I roll up there and, uh, holy shit. It, it is a, a, a fully working house fire. It's like a single story house. And there is a pretty significant fire coming from the kitchen area. And the neighbors are standing there and they're spraying water like through a window with a with a hose and they're like there's an old man that lives there and i'm like oh shit and i'm like is he home and they're like well his car is here i'm like oh okay so i start checking out the like the first floor and i go inside for a second and it's it's bad like it's not really habitable and to be blunt like if someone's up there they're dead they're dead from smoke inhalation and like there's not much reasonably i can do at that point uh, i go around back though and i see that there's like a cellar entrance like a, a staircase that leads down into the basement and i peer through the window and there is a door with a light on and it has a name written on it oh shit i think this guy has a tenant and this person probably doesn't know that the building is on fire. So I decide, all right, well, this is happening. Action movie hero time. I kick in the door with one kick. That is a lie. It took seven to eight kicks. I got to say, kicking in a door, it's a lot harder than it looks in the movies. Around kick seven, I'm like, man, okay. I, I, I really hope I get this because I'm... The body cam is going to look really, really lame. But uh, I kick the door open. I, I go in there with uh, my sergeant. He kicks the secondary door open because <laughs> there was another door. We're going through. The, uh, there's water coming through the ceiling from where they're spraying the hose. And there's a guy passed out in his bedroom, totally asleep. And I'm like, you need to wake up now. <laughs> and he looks at me. He's like, what the fuck's going on? I'm like, the house is on fire. He's like, what? I'm like, the house is on fire. We got to go right now. <laughs> My God, you must have scared him so bad. <laughs> oh, I, I do not envy the person who gets awakened by my lanky ass in the darkness at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> so, so we like drag this guy out of this burning building. And the moment I step outside, I'm like, oh, wait we really got to 
try to see if we can get in on the first floor. So uh, myself and a couple other officers are going through. We're trying to keep low. You know, keep in mind, we don't have any protective anything to do this. We really shouldn't be doing any of this, but we are. And eventually it becomes too dangerous. We leave the building, but we're notified that the, the occupant is not there, which is great. So we leave the building and that's when it hits me. Oh, I have a wife and kids. I probably shouldn't be entering a building that is on fire. Yeah, and I'm not a fireman. I'm also. I'm not a fireman. I'm many things. Also that. Also that. But uh, you know, I got tested for smoke inhalation. I was fine. Crazy thing is, it was actually Greek Easter, and this 80 year old man was still out with his family at 2:30 in the morning. The one night a year that this guy's not home at 2:30 in the morning is when his house burns down. I also had to stop his daughters from running into the house to save their cat. Don't worry, believe it or not, the cat, totally fine. It was on the couch. Firefighter walked out with it, got to be a hero. Nice little picture for the paper. It was a great time. But uh, yeah, that was the stupid thing that I did. And Megan was super stoked when I came home smelling like an ashtray. Yeah, that was great. That was that was really awesome hearing that he... Love you. ...did that. <laughs> well, honey, I'm very happy that you're okay and that you helped that man. But uh, I think we should get to the story now. Yes. Trigger warnings. Would you like to do the honors? Yes. For this case, um, we will be talking about domestic violence and we will be talking about the death of a child. So if those are non-starters for you. Understandable if they're not. Yeah. Just uh, select another episode. This case was recommended to me by my sister. Amanda, you bitch. Stop <laughs> yeah. recommending just the, the worst, worst cases things. though at like just the most heart-wrenching yeah dive into this guy's mind I, I don't want to but i did and i don't like where it took me no <laughs> so without further ado today's case is gary green this time it's goodbye levita armstead was a 32 year old teacher living in dallas texas she was a single mom to three children JT, who is 12, Jarrett, who is nine, and Jasmine, who is six. Before I continue to talk about LaVita, I just have to say in the pictures and home videos shown of the kids and, and LaVita uh, in the documentaries that I watched, I feel like you can clearly see each of their personalities shine through. JT definitely gives off older sibling vibes. I definitely connected with him on that level. Like, I'm like, I, you're the eldest sibling, I can tell. I, I know that look, you know? Mm. Jarrett is just like silly and he's the goofball of the family. And Jasmine is just a sassy little lady. I got the vibe that she's pulling the strings. Yeah, she is definitely in charge in that household. Levita is described by family and friends as loving, vibrant, and just a good person to be around. There were two documentaries that I watched and both of them featured home videos of Levita just of her dancing, singing, and just having herself a good time. You can tell that she had this love and zest for life. And you could tell that her family just meant so much to her. Like They're all family home videos. All the pictures they showed of the kids were taken by her. Like she was definitely the mom that was just like, ooh, you know, photo opportunity, you know. The mom that like kids get annoyed by like, oh, really, mom? Again, yeah, like the, a picture? Ma- the matching clothes. I, I, I feel like I see that happening. Yeah. And... yeah, for sure. And I mean, just the fact that she had this love for life and for family is probably why she invited her longtime love, Gary Green, to move in with her and her children after dating for an undisclosed amount of time. And at first, things seemed to be going well for this family. Levita and Gary married. The children loved Gary and looked up to him as a father figure, especially her son, Jarrett. Jarrett talks about, in one of the documentaries, how his biological father wasn't around. JT and Jasmine's were, but his wasn't. And so Gary was that father figure for him. Yeah. So wait, just um, for clarity's sake. Each one of them, different biological father, right? Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yes. He talks about how Gary would make like these delicious peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and he still enjoys those till this day. So despite things seemingly going well at first, they soon start to change. 
Gary becomes increasingly emotionally and physically abusive towards Levita and her children. Gary would beat JT and Jarrett for seemingly no reason with a belt. And according to both of them, he would just kind of swing and he didn't really care where it hit them. Now, I'm not suggesting that there are good reasons to beat your children, but there are people out there that believe physical abuse is an appropriate way to discipline their children. And I'm just going to leave that there. I don't have time to dive into that comment right now. I mean, you ever see the good child or the good son with Macaulay Culkin and Elijah Wood? Yes, I have. Just sometimes it's okay to drop your kid off the side of a cliff. If it's between them and Elijah Wood and they try to kill your other kid. I don't actually remember a lot of the plot of that movie. So we'll just continue with this case. According to the monster documentary that was shown on ID Discovery. Gary was not too abusive with Jasmine. I'm not really sure what that means. Do you think it was an age thing or a gender thing or um possibly both? I mean Although I guess the he, gender thing wouldn't really play because he was abusive towards, towards his yeah. wife, so Around this time, it appears that Levita's family and even some of her neighbors had their suspicions about Gary. However, nothing really came of these suspicions. Latasha Bradfield, a neighbor of Levita's, discussed how she had a bad feeling about what was going on in their home. However, she didn't really know how to approach Levita or if it was her business. Family members that expressed their concerns to Levita were asked not to get involved. Things come to a head when JT who is 12 years old at the time, tells his mother that Gary needs to go. Levita listens to her son and tells Gary it's time to leave, which he does. Really? Yeah. Huh. I'm not sure how well he took that, but, you know, I guess if someone is telling you they need their space and you need to go, like, what choice do you really have? You'd be shocked how many people say no <laughs> mm. i can't tell you how many domestics i go to where it's like i'm done with the paperwork and i'm like okay i can't tell you you have to leave but it's really 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 not smart for you to stay here tonight take the hint and they're like no i'm gonna stay okay cool i'll be back to arrest you in a couple hours when we get called again yikes yeah <laughs> so shortly after gary moves out He reaches back out to LaVita. I believe they were still in contact. Um, And he asks if he could come over. You see, Gary was on parole. And since he was listed as living at LaVita's address, that would be the address his parole officer would need to visit him at. I don't know if that's true or not, but that is essentially how he got back into her house. I mean, it sounds legit. Yeah. Yeah. So she agrees to this. On September 21st, 2009, Gary visits LaVita, who is home with Jasmine. LaVita and Gary discuss the status of their separation, which LaVita would like for good. Gary does not respond well to this. An argument ensues. In the midst of his rage, Gary finds Jasmine, binds her hands and feet, and places duct tape over her mouth. How old is she at this time? She is six. Uh, She's six. Okay. He brings her into Levita's bedroom and throws her on the bed. For the next hour, Jasmine is forced to watch Gary attack and ultimately kill her mother. What did, what did he do? Levita was stabbed 30 times. Once Gary finishes his attack on Levita, he moves on to Jasmine. He takes Jasmine into the bathroom, fills up the bathtub with water, and drowns her. An autopsy would later reveal that Jasmine had signs of asphyxiation, some bruising, and cerebral hemorrhaging, signs that she put up a fight. Can you imagine what that must be like for a sweet little six-year-old child? Like, tr- and, and Gary Green, he is a, a big dude. He's 365 pounds. He's six foot three and she's a literal child. She's a literal like peanut of a child. I mean, and she's she's bound and gagged, too. It's that there was zero chance of her being able to do anything. But it's like 
I, I, it always bothers me so much when there is strangulation or asphyxiation or drowning because it's like that takes time and that is a very personal way to kill someone you know it's not like it's something that he could have done in, in a moment like that is like a, you're going to suffer and i'm going to have to be present for the duration of however long this is going to take well not only that but he already tortured her by making her watch him kill her mother and then as soon as he turns on that bathtub she knows what's coming and it's like to what end like that level of cruelty it's just if he's angry at the mom for leaving him and i guess hurting the daughter like that was like an extension of hurting the mother i i don't know what his twisted logic was but well we'll we'll get into that in a little bit and not to jump too much ahead, but to your point, when he is being interrogated and he's talking to the officer about Jasmine's death, he talks about how it was hard for him to watch and how he's never seen anything like that in, in, except for in the movies. And he had to turn his head a couple of times. And it's like, you're literally doing this. You're not being forced Fuck to you. watch this. I know. You know what? No, nobody stopped and really thought about his feelings during the murder. You know, it was very emotionally challenging for him to all drown this, all a the daughter. strength it took. Yeah, to drown a six-year-old <laughs> asshole. After he drowns Jasmine, Gary takes a shower, puts on fresh clothes, and goes to pick up JT and Jarrett from Bible study. JT and Jarrett are surprised to see that it's Gary who shows up to get them from Bible study as this is something he really didn't do. Even more surprising is Gary asking them questions like how their day was or what they learned at church. They're both suspicious at this point because this is not his typical behavior. Is he like putting on an air of pleasantries with them? Kind of. Yeah. He's like smiling, asking them questions and they're like, what? Like, what's going on? When they arrive home, Gary pretends to make a call to Levita. He instructs JT to take a shower and Jarrett to get ready for bed. Once Jarrett gets ready, he hears Gary calling him from the kitchen. Jarrett enters the kitchen and Gary immediately places a hand over his mouth. He reaches up in one of the cabinets and accidentally grabs a butter knife, which he attempts to slit Jarrett's throat with. Gary then grabs another knife, however... This knife breaks while he attempts to stab Jarrett. Jarrett starts screaming for help from his brother. He's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill me. JT hears this from the bathroom. However, before he can get to his brother, Gary tells Jarrett to go into the bathroom. Once both boys are in the bathroom, Gary pushes Jarrett into the toilet, cutting his eye. Gary then proceeds to stab him in the stomach with one of the knives that he took from the kitchen. And only what... I can consider an act of absolute bravery. JT pushes Gary to get him away from Jarrett. Okay, so j just for perspective, their ages right now? Jarrett is nine, the one who's just been stabbed. JT is 12, and he has just pushed Gary, who is 39 years old, 365 pounds, and six foot three. And uh, also, I feel like we didn't put enough emphasis on this, multiple felon as well. So obviously, pushing Gary does it do much physically but it does appear to snap gary out of whatever rampage he was on gary starts to tell the boys that he loved their mother with his whole heart he asks them if levita was cheating on him from my understanding she was not he then asks them to give him one reason why he shouldn't kill them Jarrett says because we're just kids and we aren't going to tell anyone. This seems to be a good answer for Gary, because with that, he tells them he needs to show them something. He leads the boys over to their mother's bedroom, where they find her deceased on the floor. And then, in just an even more disturbing manner, he tells them, now come look in here. And he leads them to the bathroom where Jasmine is. As the boys are trying to process what they're seeing, he asks them one more time if they know of any men that their mother had been texting. <laughs> like it matters at this point. Yeah. Like, or just 
the the complete disconnect of like, oh, okay, yeah, like like this isn't the most traumatizing thing that they are probably ever going to witness in their life. He then tells them that he loved their mother, but he had to kill her so she wouldn't divorce him. Okay, uh, a slight logistical problem with that. So, like, if they get divorced, he doesn't get to be with her anymore. Um, also, if she's dead, he still doesn't get to be with her anymore. And it's an awful thing to do. I feel like there's a disconnect there. That well, he I feel like he didn't think that one through. Mm, for abusive men, it's on their terms. So murder is sometimes, in their mind, the better option because it is their choice. Is there also a little bit of the... If I can't have you, no one can. Absolutely. Thing too. Wow. Absolutely. I that I always thought that was such a cliche. It's so disappointing to hear that that's like actually a thing, that that's actually a a thought in some of these people's minds. In one of the interviews that Gary gives, he talks about uh, it's, it's it's so like haunting how much work he had to put into killing Levita because it was taking something that he loved and reducing it to nothing. It there's something so off-putting about this man making her murder all about him. You know, like him sitting there and being like, you know, I'm a I'm a big guy. You know the cardio it takes to stab a woman thirty times. It's exhausting. It's just like what the f like. How are you making this about you? How are you trying to make yourself like a victim in this, as if you're not the one who actually did it? I mean. According to Gary, you know, Levita hurt him. She deserved this because she wanted to leave and he loved her and there was no reason for her to leave. And no one leaves Gary green. Uh, something tells me historically that that's not accurate, but it, whatever he has to tell himself to justify what he did, I guess. Yeah. So after asking that awful question... He then asks them to get him a fresh pair of clothes from the closet, which they do. He gives JT Levita's cell phone and says, OK, once I leave, call the cops, but don't call them before I leave, which JT does try to call them before he leaves. But Gary hears the phone ringing. So he like hangs up immediately. He then tells the boys, you know how I always say never say goodbye See you later. Well, this is goodbye. God. And he proceeds to drive away in what I believe was Levita's car. How long do you think he had that line in the chamber? Like he that that he definitely thought about that. I was like, oh, this is going to be a great little send off for these boys. I I think yes, but I also think when we get into the psych stuff, that is something that is central to his psyche. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So Gary drives away. JT calls 911 and the dispatch call is just chaotic. There's poor service, it appears, on um, you know, JT's end. You can hear the boys are visibly upset. And one of them has been stabbed. One of them has been stabbed. And the dispatch just keeps saying, you know, police or EMS. And it's like, at some point, like, just send both. You, you clearly hear you have chill. I mean, I, I don't work in this field, so I don't know. But it's like you hear children. You don't know what's going on. Send both. Well, what's also, the worst that could happen? Like, I, 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 I can't <laughs> speak to other departments, but like you never just send EMS. Police always get sent first because police are out there on the road. It goes on and on. Police, I'm at, hello? Oh, can someone else talk to me? Oh, your younger brother? It's just so JT ends up carrying Jarrett across the street to Latasha's house, their neighbor. She enters the door. She sees Jarrett holding his stomach. And uh, he's actually the one on the phone with dispatch at this time. And she's like, what's going on? And he says that Gary tried to kill him and that he killed their mom and Jasmine. And she's like, what? Like, what are you talking about? What's going on? So she, she Cause, takes... Because the there's, there's no way that that's what happened. Uh, that's yeah. A, that's, she's like, yeah. what? She takes the phone from Jarrett. She's talking to the dispatch. And <laughs> the dispatch, you know, police or EMS. And she's like, I don't know. Like, I'm the neighbor. The kids are saying this. I'm going over to the house right now. So she goes across the street to Levita's house. Upon 
opening the door, she notices that there's blood on the doorknob. And she's like, lady, there is blood on this doorknob. I'm going to like push the door in. I'm not touching it. And she just, she walks in. She just sees blood. Yeah. Can we, I just, a uh, quick second. Latasha, the absolute balls on this woman to go into this situation alone. Cause here's the thing, like, something happened it doesn't necessarily have to be like what these kids are saying but you know something bad happened and for you to just completely put yourself like i don't care i my friend might be in danger i'm gonna go over there but then for her also to have the foresight of if this is what it seems it is let me not contaminate the crime scene that much let me not touch the doorknob let me let me you know like really you're an amazing person yeah she walks in the house. She's she's describing the scene to the dispatcher. She's like, oh, my God, like there's blood everywhere. Yeah, this is a horrible 911 call. I think we'll probably play a, a, a clip from it. So she's walking through the house. She goes back to Levita's bedroom and she finds Levita on the floor and she tells dispatch, my God, like there's blood everywhere. My friend's purple. She's not bleeding. I think she's dead. Uh, And the dispatch worker's like, "Okay, where's the six year old? And, you know, Latasha at this point is getting a little freaked out. She's like, I don't know. I can't find her. I'm afraid that like I don't know where Gary is. I don't know like if he's going to come back. I want to leave, which is totally fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so very, very rational she, thought. And I mean, another issue that was going on was Latasha's like, where are the police? Like, I don't hear them. <laughs> what, like, why don't I hear sirens coming yet if you dispatch them already? She leaves the house to be with Jarrett and JT. Moments later, police arrive to Levita's home and are shocked by what they see. Homicide detective Robert Quirk recalls the large amount of blood spatter and broken knives throughout the home. Broken, broken knives. It, there are pictures. It's just I, I don't I don't understand it. How there are just so many broken knives. It's do you know how much force you have to use to break a knife on flesh and bone? No, I can't imagine. Police also find two handwritten letters on Levita's bed. One letter appears to be written by Levita, stating that she wants an annulment, and the other, more sinister letter is from Gary. It states, You asked to see the monster, so here he is. The monster you made me. There will be five lives taken today, me being the fifth. Pray that the Lord allows my soul to enter heaven. If not, I will burn in hell forever. So... It's her fault. Yeah. She made him do it. She made him the monster. Yeah. I mean, right? Other people are responsible for our behavior. 
Didn't 100%. you know that? After leaving Levita's home, Detective Quirk speaks with JT and Jared at the hospital, and the boys inform him that Gary is responsible for this crime. A bolo is issued for Gary, but it turns out to be unnecessary as he ends up turning himself in at the encouragement of his mother and brother the next day. Hold up, a bolo? Yeah, I don't bolo. know what that terminology is. Be on lookout. Oh. Right, be on the lookout. Yeah. There you go, audience. You learned a new cop thing. It's funny, we actually don't use that in my department, but now, now you guys know. Big old loser out and about. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to think of that. Okay. Accurate. <laughs> it turns out that after Gary commits this crime, he drives away and is planning to commit suicide. He calls his mom and his brother and they are able to track him to an undisclosed location. He discusses what he's done and they encourage him to turn himself in. That's um, actually a nicer sequence of events than I would have expected. I mean, I don't think it's it's not right to judge someone's family on an individual's actions, but I don't know. I just didn't necessarily think that that's the way it was going to get handled, where they were like, you need to turn yourself in. It's just, it's just nice to see the it pan out that way. Yeah. The interrogation is pretty straightforward. Gary... I, I wouldn't even use the word interrogation for it. It really was. Yeah, the confession, I guess, because yeah. he pretty much tells Detective Quirk everything. His motivation, she wanted to leave, and he did not want that. And so his plan was to kill all of them so they could all be together. Together where? In heaven. Oh, uh, you. That, I, I, I think that's one of the big 10 no-nos is killing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's allowed. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can be like, sorry, and you'll get in. But I'm almost positive. I'm not a religious man. Almost positive that suicide is like suicide a is like no-no. the absolute no, no. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's not going there no matter which way he jokes he on him. Turns out it was the Mormons that were right. <laughs> My just God. them. Just them. Everyone it's else just wrong. The Mormons stole that joke from South Park. Sorry. So, yeah, I'm. Like I said, Gary, he confesses to everything, and he even recommends that he receive the death penalty. Well, yeah, I mean, he doesn't have the follow-through to finish his plan off himself. I guess that's just a really protracted version of suicide by cop. Yeah, I, I also think that people may not realize just because you get the death penalty doesn't mean like, all right, you're sentenced, and now next week you will be put to death. Well, when did this all happen? This happened in 2009. Okay, and he so he's is, definitely dead, right? Uh, nope, he's he's still alive. Oh, okay. He's still alive in Texas. That's very surprising. Yeah, and there's no date set for him yet either. Huh, well, I guess we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more later, but huh, odd. On October 26, 2010, Gary's trial for capital murder begins. During the trial, Gary's dark past comes to life, causing more heartbreak and pain for LaVita and Jasmine's loved ones. You see, LaVita was not the first woman to suffer abuse at the hands of Gary Green. In 1989, Gary was arrested in Dallas for possession and intent to distribute crack cocaine. The arresting female officer testified that Gary physically assaulted her during the arrest, and she was hospitalized for a week due to the extent of her injuries. Yeah. Two of Gary's ex-girlfriends reported that he had physically assaulted them. One of these women was Gary's high school girlfriend, Jennifer. Jennifer reported that she had broken up with Gary after graduation, and in August that year, he beat her stabbed her between her breasts, and attempted to strangle her. So all of this really heavy physical shit happened after she tried to leave. Yes. Interesting. Did you say he tried to strangle her? Yes. That's incredible that she didn't die. Well, she got Gary to stop by telling him that she loved him. Uh, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. No, no, you got to do what you got to do. My ugh is not for her. It's just... For him to be like, okay, I guess I'll stop strangling you and we're totally good now. Like, like just the, the delusion that, yeah, I can strangle you and you'll say you love me and it, it's definitely real. You definitely mean it and we're going to be totally fine now. Yeah. Well, he did drive her to the hospital after almost killing her. I, I guess that's good. 
she provided pictures to the court as evidence. And these images are incredibly disturbing. You can see dark ligature marks on her neck. And in one of the pictures, her eyes are completely yeah. bloodshot. It's just, it's yeah, This awful. wasn't like a, a barehanded strangle. No. He tried to garrote her. Yeah. With, <sighs> what, what did he use? I don't know if they I, went into so, it. Some type of cord or, or shoestring or something. Like the, the markings yeah. are so, uh, it's... It, it's te- it's awful. The other woman, Shalanda, an ex-wife of Gary and mother of two of his children, reported that Gary was easily angered and would choke her to the point of unconsciousness. He even did so once while she was pregnant. Is the is the, the baby the, the baby's okay? I, I believe so. I, assume? I believe they're fine. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. Gary's former supervisor at the grocery store he worked at. Said he was a gentleman and there was never a problem. Nope. Uh, oh, he worked it. at this grocery store and he subsequently robbed it in 1990. This supervisor also testified about Gary's violent nature. On the day of the robbery, Gary fired shots throughout the store and kicked open an office door. Gary's motivation for this robbery was his termination. He really doesn't like it when uh, things end and they're not on his accord, does he? Yep. I'm noticing a pattern of behavior here. It goes back to that saying that he told the kids, it's never say goodbye, it's always see you later, right? Because saying see you later is not permanent where goodbye can be. Uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get into this. After the robbery, Gary was sentenced to 20 years for this offense. Now, I couldn't find the exact information on this, but I believe he was paroled for this uh, and did not serve the full sentence. Well, yeah, because you said the robbery happened when? 1990. And this murder happened in 2009. 2009. So that would have been 19 years. So he definitely got out earlier. That makes sense. Me and math. One of the witnesses for the prosecution was a former corrections officer who allegedly helped Gary get paroled, married him briefly, and oh, then and then what the but fuck? Gary left her shortly after. Wait, really? Yes. Well, that is not the way I expected that to pan out. Yeah. One day we're going to have to do like a little aside episode about corrections officers getting involved with criminals that they're with because especially with what just happened that that corrections officer that helped break that guy out and then she blew her head off in the car when they crashed yeah both jt and Jarrett take the stand during the trial and describe the terror that they endured that night levita's mother margarita also takes the stand and verifies the handwriting in both letters as Levita's and Gary's. Latasha Bradfield, the neighbor that we discussed earlier, recounts her experience of taking over the 911 call from Jarrett and discovering Levita's body. During their closing argument, the prosecution shows a video of Jasmine reciting Langston Hughes's poem, I Too, to the jury on October 28, 2010. Gary Green is found guilty of capital murder. So was there any a- attempt to defend him? Because he said it seemed like he wanted to get sentenced. I'm kind of amazed he didn't take a plea. So he was always intending on pleading guilty. I think the real challenge is what happens next. Should he get, you know, the death penalty or should he get life in prison due to mitigating circumstances that led to the murder now would those mitigating circumstances be look at me i'm crazy mental illness can be considered a mitigating circumstance but you know it's wild how many people try the insanity defense and how often it fails like yes it's like 90 most people are not insane and a lot of people you know they they try to play insane but don't do it correct yeah, you know, like well, there's, there's like that a, recently, haven't we? Probably I'm trying to think there, there was some interview with somebody pretending to be insane and it was just like, oh, this is embarrassing. Yeah. It's like someone who claims to hear the devil is not the same person that is smearing feces on the wall. So if you think you're going to get away with the insanity plea by doing both of those things, yeah. you're not. People who aren't insane often try to exaggerate uh the symptoms that they are trying to 
show uh, people that they're insane, which is why I went with that example with the poop smearing and, and hearing the devil. Um, that's just not a behavior that is consistent or really realistic if you are experiencing that sort of auditory hallucination. Now, it, it does seem like a lot of times what ends up happening with these people who try to, to, to feign insanity is they end up like mishmashing and creating like an amalgamation of these deficiencies and these, these tendencies that just don't exist in the wild. Yeah. Kind of like how in Sia's movie, Music, their portrayal of a girl with autism, it's like you just put together a bunch of autistic cliches that don't actually go hand in hand often, you yeah. know, where it's like, this is a caricature. This isn't like an actual Person. real thing yeah. that's out there in the wild. Yeah. So they're not going for insanity. Like they're not saying he's insane at the time of his crime, but they are trying to say like, this guy has mental health issues that played a role in this and that as a result led to this murder. So I'm guessing he just ended up changing his tune in, in regards to wanting to die. Yeah. Because it would be ultimately his decision as to whether or not yeah. he opts for a defense of any kind. Yeah. Hmm. So Gary's sentencing trial takes place on November 1st, 2010. Would Gary be given the death penalty or were there mitigating circumstances that despite leading to the murders should result in him receiving a life sentence in prison. Well, spoiler alert, we kind of already <laughs> talked about this, yeah. but let's pretend we didn't. Go. The defense presents Gary's mental health as a mitigating circumstance. One month prior to the murders, Gary checked himself into Timberlawn, a mental hospital, due to feelings of depression and passive suicidal ideation. Passive suicidal? What is, is that like you're suicidal, but you don't have a plan? Yes, without plan or intent, like feeling like you want to die, um, you don't have anything to live for, but not really having like a, like you said, like an active plan or so intent I guess to would, do so. Would you consider that that kind of a person's not an imminent risk? Or is there, that not... uh, I mean, there you have to take other things into consideration, like yeah. have they made attempts before and whatnot, but just that alone, no, not necessarily. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to get into the mental health stuff a little later, but several of Gary's family members would testify for the defense on the history of Gary's mental health and the mental health of the family. Boy, does some of this stuff run deep within Gary's family. JT, Jarrett, Margarita and Jasmine's father, Ray, all make victim impact statements. I totally forgot in all of this that she has a biological father that's around. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about him in a little bit. In Jared's statement, he says directly to Gary, Hey, Gary, I love you. And I thought you weren't going to betray me like this. To me, you were my father and I love you but I'm not going to let you take over my life. He's 10 or 11 years old making this statement. To the person who should have been there to protect him and instead stabbed him. Yeah. On November 5th, 2010, the jury finds that there were no mitigating circumstances that led to the death of Levita and Jasmine, and Gary Green is sentenced to death. He has tried to appeal this, um, but has lost every appeal. Is, I'm guessing that's part of the reason why we're here in our Lord's year of 2022 and this fucking guy's still breathing the same air as us. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Sounds good. So now I'm going to dive into some mental health information that was disclosed during Gary's trial. Oh, but we already, they already said he's totally fine. He's, yeah, there's nothing wrong with him. Well, I guess that's going to be an interesting thing, like the delineation between, you know, you can be mentally ill. You're but, still responsible for yeah. your behavior. That's the thing. But remember, kids, what's our mantra? Come on, you know it. Mental health is not your fault. But it is your responsibility. Yes. So I would just like to put up a quick little disclaimer that I am not diagnosing Gary Green with any mental illness, I will be discussing the mental health disorders that he was diagnosed as having by the professionals that assessed him and how his thoughts, moods, and behaviors align with these diagnoses. I am going to state up front that Gary's mental health diagnoses 
did not cause Gary to commit murder, nor are they justifications for his history of abusive behavior. How Gary's mental health diagnoses present in him may not be how they present in other people. Mental health is very nuanced. And I feel like, you know, we're human. So a lot of times we see something like, oh, this person has, I'll take a, a hot one, borderline personality disorder. This must be how everyone with borderline personality disorder is. And that is incorrect. But that's, that's a conversation for another time. During the trial, several of Gary's family members, uh, his Aunt Shirley, his mother Mary, his grandmother Bertha, and his younger brother Nisazno, like I said, they, they testify about uh, Gary's mental health and the history of the family's mental health. All right, hold up. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't let that slide. His mother's name was Shirley? His aunt. His aunt was Shirley. His mother was... Mary. Mary. His grandmother was... Bertha. Bertha. His name was Gary. His name was Gary. And then at a fucking left field, they were like, Nisazno for the brother. Yes. Anybody ever watch Hey Arnold? Because I always found it really funny that it was like Bob and Miriam and their kids are Helga and Olga. It's like, wh wh where did you pull those out of? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I found that a little funny. <laughs> well, like I said, they talk about Gary's mental illness, that the family, the homicide related deaths in the family and the domestic violence that Gary witnessed and experienced in the home. I'm sorry, homicide incidents in the family yes i didn't type it out but someone there was a a nephew that shot his wife or a cousin that shot it somebody shot one family member shot a spouse of theirs oh yes that's not cool yeah violence is never the answer guys well gary's father was physically abusive towards his mother and even went as far as beating her and kicking her stomach when she was pregnant with Gary's younger brother uh, in front of him. Uh, <laughs> I, words escape me sometimes. Just the horrible things that people do. It's just absurd. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think Gary was pretty young when this happened. Like I I, I want to say he was maybe two because after this, his dad leaves and like Gary, like doesn't see him. Gary was described as being withdrawn and paranoid as a child. He often played by himself and he was afraid of making friends as he thought they would make fun of him. However, this appeared to change when Gary entered high school in middle school. Gary climbed up on a roof and threatened to jump off. However, his aunt talked him out of it. After that incident, Gary reported feeling misunderstood by others. Gary's grandmother stated he was never a normal child. She goes on to say that as a child, he often felt the devil was after him and did not want to live as a result. She recalled on one occasion, Gary biting off the head of a snake. <laughs> when... She told his mother, Mary, about this. She kind of just wrote it off and said there was nothing wrong with him. I mean, if Ozzy gets to do it. Gary's grades were poor and he struggled to do housework and yard work. He dropped out of school in 11th grade. Oh, man, that was actually pretty close to the finish line. It's interesting uh, reading the testimony provided by Gary's family. Most of them seem to be on the same page uh, with the exception of his mother. She didn't really feel he had any mental health issues and she reported that although the grades he received in school weren't great, they were still fine by her, but like he was failing. Well, of course he can't have any mental health issues because that might reflect poorly on her. I'm not saying that that's accurate. I'm saying that that's probably well, how she felt. She was also described as being like very cold and detached and she had a nervous breakdown herself at some point in time. So, you know, it sounds like she also had uh, her own issues. Kind of like the blind raising the blind. Yeah. That was a play on the blind, leading the blind. She also stated that she believed he did not have any intellectual disabilities. A school psychologist, Dr. Kelly Gray Smith, reviewed Gary's academic record and reported he was not successful academically. And his pattern of academic failure was chronic, pervasive and alarming. Academically, he performed in the lowest 10 percent across all grade levels and appeared to have poor social skills. Gary was never evaluated for special education services. Dr. Gilbert Martinez, 
a neuropsychologist who assessed and interviewed Gary, testified that he diagnosed him with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, and features of several personality disorders, including borderline, avoidant, paranoid, depressive, and antisocial personality disorder. So he's a mix of um, Scott Ebby and what's his face? Uh, crap. Lauren Gooding's killer. Steve, right? Stephen McDaniels? Uh, right? Or no, he was schizotypal. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, just, it, it's interesting and once again like just because you have these things doesn't make you these people but we do see a lot of the same like diagnoses, diagnoses, see, popping, diagnoses up. popping up well you know personality disorders they describe behavior and things like you know schizoaffective or uh, depression those describe someone's mood that's so, a really interesting way to put that. Yeah, so you're, you know, describing kind of two different things. Hmm. We'll start with schizoaffective disorder. What is that? Well, it is a severe mental health condition characterized by the symptoms of schizophrenia along with the mood disorder, such as depression or anxiety. There are two types. Schizoaffective disorder, depressed type, where the individual experiences feelings of sadness, worthlessness, emptiness, and schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, where the individual experiences symptoms of mania, such as racing thoughts, euphoria, and increased risky behavior. There is no known cause for this disorder, but a combination of genetics, brain chemistry, and structure, uh, stress and drug use, mainly psychoactive drugs like LSD, seem to be contributing factors. Schizoaffective disorder is usually treated with antipsychotic medication in vega and psychotherapy uh, with the focus on CBT or CBTP, which is cognitive behavioral therapy oh. for psychosis. Family support and psychosocial services uh, like peer support and case management are known to be uh, effective as well. As far as personality disorder traits go, it's possible to diagnose someone as having traits of a personality disorder without them meeting the full criteria for any given personality disorder. It would probably just be, um, I think the, the terminology in the DSM is like other personality disorder not specified or something like that. Hmm. Um, again, diagnoses are very nuanced and they're very controversial in their nature being that do we need to put a label on certain patterns of behavior? Does it help to know that? Does it help to put people in these boxes? I think it's a bit of a complex answer. You know, I think sometimes people like having a name for what they're going through and other times I think... It doesn't matter, you know, um, if you come to therapy because you're grieving the loss of your grandmother who died 10 years ago, and I say, oh, you have prolonged grief disorder. I feel like most people don't really care. They just want to be able to move past the grief that they're feeling, not necessarily be like, oh, there's a name for this. Oh, good. So I think it just speaks more to a human need to categorize and box and name everything. But you bring up an interesting point of like how useful is that sometimes? Yeah. And I, like I talk about like we see what can happen, especially during cases like this where it's like, oh, someone has this. And then everyone tries to generalize that diagnosis and what it must look like for everyone that has it. Yeah. And I, I think there's something to be said about the fact that it's like do a very large portion of the people that commit these class of crimes have similar diagnoses mentally speaking yeah do they make up a significant portion of the people in general who have those mental disorders no yeah you know it's kind of like this is a joke but it's the only way i can even like tr kind of convey what i'm trying to say not everyone with a mustache is a pedophile but every pedophile has a mustache it's kind of like that kind of thing oh my god yes <laughs> It's a great joke. You be quiet. So in this case, Dr. Martinez talks about how Gary admitted to lighting a dog on fire in childhood, uh, to which he met the diagnostic criteria for conduct disorder in childhood. Also, biting the head off a snake would also meet that criteria. Now, I forget 
which case we talked about antisocial personality disorder? I think Scott Ebby. Maybe. I don't. Or maybe we talked about it with Chris Watts a little bit. I don't know. There was there was one case, but if you remember, you cannot diagnose personality disorders um, before an individual turns 18. However, one of the uh, diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder is a diagnosis of conduct disorder in childhood or adolescence. And I'm guessing hurting animals is a uh, big yeah, old red that, flag. That's, that is absolutely meeting the criteria for that. However, as an adult, Gary once strangled an ex-girlfriend. We, we talked about this. Then he drove her to the hospital uh, for medical attention. Now, that is not something that's consistent with that criteria. Showing that level of empathy or remorse. It's weird, right? Yeah. That he would be like, all right, let me... Let me make sure you're okay now. And Dr. Martinez argues that point as well. That was kind of a strange behavior for him to to have. I certainly thought so. Central to Gary's psyche, here it is, I feel, is a fear of abandonment. I mean, it was only his dad that... Oh. A fear of abandonment is often seen in individuals diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Gary's father left when he was young. He had an emotionally unavailable mother. He struggled to make friends at a young age. These are all incredibly traumatic things to experience as a child where our perception of the world is being shaped. We see how he responded when his job fired him, when his romantic partners tried to leave him. I'm not saying this is justification for this behavior, but I do believe Gary was operating from this fear when he chose to abuse women yeah. and react violently. And, and just for clarification for the audience, when we do this, when we look at this, we are not trying to justify what he did. We are trying to understand why in his mind he did the things that he did, because the only way to stop these kinds of things is to understand how these dominoes fall yeah we're not saying that he's justified in any of this just on you know just for that clarification making that extra clear yeah this choice to abuse women and react violently made gary feel like he had some control over these situations fear unfortunately is a strong motivating factor as previously mentioned, about a month before the murders, Gary checked himself into Timberlawn, a mental hospital. Gary called his mother and stated he wanted to go to sleep and never wake up. Nasazno, Gary's brother, stated that around this time, Gary confessed to him that he was hearing demons, feeling stressed, and had nothing to live for. Nasazno's advice to his brother was to pray. Now, I am not trying to knock religious folk here. But if someone confides in you about their mental health struggles, please don't offer them prayer as a solution, at least by itself. One's faith could definitely help provide comfort in a time of mental crisis. But dare I say it is not going to fix the problem. I mean, if you see someone choking on food in public, are you going to go up to them and say, oh, pray that, you know, you you get through this? Or are you going to pray over them? Hopefully not. Hopefully you're going to try to assist them yourself. Call 911 or look for someone that can help. We have to start viewing mental distress just as we view physical distress. It's okay to say, I don't know how to help you with that. How about we find you someone who can? Or I can't speak to hearing demons or feeling like I don't want to live. But how can I make you feel safe right now? Or what can I do for you that would bring you some comfort? Unfortunately, Gary was only admitted to Timberlawn for five days as he signed himself out and had LaVita come pick him up. During his short stay, he was monitored closely due to the passive suicidal ideation and was diagnosed with a major depressive episode. He was prescribed medication, but his stay was too short to know if these medications would prove to be effective. Yeah, because that's something that you and I know when it comes to medication for uh, for, for mental health reasons. It's functionally a crapshoot. Like, it really is like, all right, we're going to try these things mm-hmm. and we're going to give it like a month because that's how long it takes to really see. And if it works, 
great. If it doesn't work, okay, we're going to have to wait, get it out of your system, and then try something else. And it's literally just like a guessing game until you hit the thing that works. And that takes a lot of time, and it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to get through. Suffice it to say, five days, probably not enough time to figure that out. Yeah. Like I said, where I don't think Gary's mental illness was responsible for his act that he committed, there is a part of me that feels bad for Gary in the sense that there were clearly problems and no one intervened or offered help. You know, when the school psychologist testified about like his grades, like she noticed that he had never been evaluated for an intellectual disability and she really couldn't explain why, like someone with such poor grades, why they wouldn't have had an assessment. His family clearly saw signs that he was not okay and they didn't act other than bringing it up once in a while with each other, like, this is a problem, or Gary hears this. And I mean, that's that's common in a lot of families, where you don't want to admit that there's a problem, so you just kind of shrug it off or ignore it, but it doesn't go away. No, it festers in the dark and becomes gangrenous and yeah, causes horrible things to happen. The only way he saw men treat women in his life were when, you know, they were physically abusing them. And so he grew up with this idea that that is love. You physically, or that's, that's his, I don't even know if that's so much love, but this is just like the role that men play in, in relationships. And I just, I wonder how he might've been a different person had he received the help he needed Yeah. back then. Yeah. Maybe better choices could have been available to him yeah but unfortunately that's not how it played out yeah he also according um to the neuropsychologist he didn't really receive any adequate treatment like while he was in jail and uh like we spoke about he wasn't at timberlawn for that long so there really couldn't be any type of adequate treatment there either it just it's terrible all around we're talking about gary's mental health but think about what JT, Jarrett, Levita's mother, Jasmine's father, just Latasha, the neighbor, just how their Fucking, lives. Detective Quirk. Oh, Detective Quirk, yeah. Oh, the responding officers, like, once again, the ripples that these events cause go far beyond the immediate victims. Yeah. They impact the community, the responding officers and EMTs. Her students, the, she was a teacher. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 these are devastating and far-reaching consequences and you know once again like the cycle just repeats now yeah you know? in the documentaries jt talks about you know his struggle with ptsd and he's had i think four suicide attempts he has a hard time trusting others and opening up because you know I, I can't blame him for that <laughs> i really me can't. either of course that's such a hard thing to to come back from. And not only that, I don't want to like talk badly about anyone's family, but th th a very common response when people are grieving is to say like, stay strong, stay strong for the family. No, these, these were kids. These boys were 12 and nine when their mother and their sister died. You not, be not strong died. for them. Was yeah. Were, were killed. Brutally murdered. Yeah. Like yeah. you stay strong for them. You take care of them. They are not the rocks. Do not put that pressure on them. After going through a trial. After going through a trial, one of them was stabbed. One of them had to like carry his like stabbed younger brother. It's just, it's, it's awful. And you know, there's a lot that we didn't know about the logistics of what happened to them afterwards. Because as, as we stated earlier, each one of those kids had a different dad. So what happens to them after this murder? Are they separated? Or do they stay together? Do they go into foster care? Like, there were so many question marks about where does this all end for them, you know? Yeah, it, it's it's terrible. Because, like, the, the, the brutal truth is, like, when the cameras stop rolling and the public stops giving a shit about this case because the killer's been caught and tried, they still have their entire lives ahead of them having to deal with this. And... 
they don't have the support of of the public anymore. It's it's just on them. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just it's just a terrible thing to to have to go through and you know, their their lives were completely uprooted after this. And I mean, obviously anyone's is when there's a murder, but theirs just really got torn apart. It was their entire the, the infrastructure of their life was gone. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was watching, I think it was the online documentary, Ray, Jasmine's father, talked about how I believe he would see Jasmine on weekends. And, you know, there were a couple of times where she didn't want to go home or she looked nervous or sad. And he kind of just took this as like, oh, you know, she's a daddy's girl. Like she just got used to being here and she has to leave again. And unfortunately, one weekend he dropped her off, you know, it would be the last that he, last time he saw her. Just people in the comments, like blaming this man for, you know, wow, how could you not have done anything? How could you just let your daughter die? It's like, you don't think that this, and I'm not saying that I feel he's responsible because I I don't think he is. Right. Like you don't think this man doesn't fucking kick himself in the head like every day i can't believe this happened hindsight's 2020 like you want a monday morning quarterback the murder of a child cool story jerk off yeah fucking people with their keyboards it's just like think about what you are going to type before you type it you know we have the privilege of telling these stories And then turning off our, you know, laptops or our podcast and being like, and that's it. Wasn't that awful? But there are people that are, this is part of their lives. They're still living this. And so they don't need Joe Schmo's opinion, who knows nothing about their family being like, you know, you should have done X, Y, Z for your kid. I mean, Megan and I can speak to this with a certain amount of of experience. Like, it has happened that we've covered cases and it's gotten back to people involved be it the community or family members. So like, just be aware that there are people on the other side of these stories. Yeah. And they see your comments. Yeah. And it hurts them. One of the other themes that, you know, I think came up a lot was, were there people that knew about Gary being abusive towards LaVita? And was there anything that they could have and should have done. And I think a lot of times it's not that people don't want to help. It's that they don't know how they don't know what to say. You kind of want to mind your own business if you're not sure, because you don't want the embarrassment of maybe being wrong or you don't want to make things worse. It's so much easier to, you know, it's like when you watch a movie and it's the cliche of, you know, the battered housewife arrives and she's explaining away a black guy. Like that's not, how this shit goes down. And like a lot of times people, they don't want the help for various reasons. And, and, and it's important to not judge them for feeling that way, even though you might think, well, that's, that's objectively wrong. They should want help. But a lot of people don't even realize that they're in an abusive relationship until they exit that relationship. And a lot of people maybe aren't ready to to admit that or have that conversation. Like, this is a much more difficult and nuanced subject than just simply saying, how could you let Mark beat you again? That's awful. You should just leave him. Like, that is not how this works. Yeah. And as I've said in previous podcasts, the most dangerous time for a woman in an abusive relationship is when she decides to leave. So that factor is the number one reason why women stay in these relationships. If you feel right now like you have a friend or a family member that is being abused, here are some tips that you can take with you to, you know, if you want to address the situation. You can ask the person if they're safe or if they, you know, need someone to talk to. You can provide them with domestic violence hotlines. There's a lot of, I mean, they're all free, but there's a lot of, you know, hotlines that are local to the person. I think in the program notes, we have the link for like the, yeah, the that's national always up one. There. That's always up there. You can offer them a ride to um, a local shelter, a place to make a phone call or babysit while they attend appointments. And if you see that someone is in immediate danger, 
call 911. Yeah. If they're not in immediate danger, not everybody loves having the police called. No, so, most people aren't too jazzed when I show up. Yeah. So if you can really avoid that, I would that would be my recommendation. And now on the other side of things, if you know of or if you have a feeling that a friend or a family member is an abuser. Oh. Yep, because I mean, we have to talk about That's there, a way more complicated thing to well, deal there, with. There's treatment for them too. Okay. Which but, is you know, good. You but, want them to be not that. So, yeah, there yeah. should be some form of treatment. So, I mean, you can address them. You could tell them up front, like, there's no excuses for abuse and that it's going to result in the loss of their friends, family, homes, jobs, you know. If it doesn't stop, look into treatment providers for them. There are support groups for abusers out there. It's, it's actually a pretty popular treatment. So there is help. My last recommendation, once again, if you see that someone is abusing someone else right in front of you or you feel like they're in immediate danger, call the police. Yeah. And I know that this is a very uh, on brand popular subject right now, but I do feel like it's important to just state men can be victims of abuse, too. It doesn't, it doesn't just go one way. Women can abuse men. Men can abuse women. Women can abuse women. Men can abuse men. It goes in any possible variation of that. So yeah, ultimately this case, like I said, I've, I've been (laughs) researching this for so long and I feel like I'm never ready to present. And it's because I, I, not that I get like attached, but like I really sit and think about the victims for such a long time and it's just like it, it's hard to it's hard to think about and like I said it's hard to just kind of write something for a podcast and be like all right guys wait we'll talk to you later like I'm just I'm I'm thinking about Levita's family her sons JT and Jarrett her mom Margarita Jasmine's father Ray and his wife and Jasmine's stepmother just all of these people that have to live with their untimely loss and there's there there just aren't words like there just are no words that I can say just to express how sorry I am for their loss and how I wish things could be different for them yeah you know I almost wish that like we could talk to one of them you know me too and that was in no way a ham-fisted segue into this surprise. So um, we actually had the pleasure of having a conversation with JT. We were able to track him down and we reached out to him and asked if he'd be interested in providing an interview because it has been so long. Uh, he He's like an adult now with kids yeah. and everything. And he was so gracious. He, re- he immediately responded And we sat with him and we spoke to him for about an hour. So we'll be posting the entirety of that alongside with this episode as a dedicated survivor spotlight. So you can hear directly from the source what happened from his point of view. And, uh, you know, I just I want to take a real quick second because I reached out on the True Crime podcast group and I asked, you know, just what people would want to know if this kind of uh, opportunity presented itself. And uh, Deborah D., Lily B uh, and Janine M all gave great suggestions. Um, it really, it was it was very helpful. And I wanted to give a special shout out to Margot, the host of Military Murder. We had a very lovely uh, back and forth on Facebook, and she gave me some very great pointers because she's had the opportunity to talk to some people also in this world. So uh, thank you, and, and check out her podcast. It's awesome. It's called Military Murder. We'll include a little a link in the uh, in the show notes. So, I, I mean, what are your closing thoughts, Paul? So there's not much in, in the way for me to discuss in terms of policing on this case because, weirdly enough, just like policing really just wasn't a factor here. This is just something horrible that happened, and immediately the person turned themselves in. There was no real investigative anything that needed to happen because he just he just gave up. He just turned himself in, you know? It's a little disappointing to hear that there were some issues with uh, with dispatch on this one. I mean, they should just send people out immediately, and that's just that's just how it is up here. Um, I don't know if I've ever discussed the way that domestics work in, in New York State, but 
we basically have it set up that any domestic situation that happens gets a report. And what constitutes a domestic incident in New York State is any familial relation and or like dating marriage intimate relation. And it can be former, you know, it doesn't have to be active at the moment. So anything that happens in that confines gets documented, even if it is so much as a argument. And they do this because it, this is all an effort to protect victims. Uh, another big part of that is the way crime works in New York is uh, a crime is committed and then the victim is ultimately the one that decides whether or not an arrest is made or charges are pressed. Now, that's not applicable always. You know, things like uh, like murder, they don't really get to pick that, but that's my point. One of the only instances where that is not the case is any crime that is committed in the context of a domestic is always a must arrest. It doesn't matter how small it is, if it's a domestic and a crime was committed, they're getting locked up. Now, Megan, would you like to venture a guess as to why that's the case? Um, because a lot of times the person that's abused does not want to press charges. Exactly. If Becky is getting beat by Johnny and we've been to the house 10 times and every time she's got a black eye and a bruise and we know what's happening, it's obvious what's happening, but she doesn't want him arrested sooner or later we're going to show up and she's going to be dead so because that happened so often we just had to remove the option from that person we had to unfortunately take it out of their hands which does this backfire sometimes and people get locked up for things that maybe they shouldn't i.e like breaking a dish or something during an argument yeah that happens but you know i think it's a small price to pay for keeping people safe so that's the only real insight I can give into this case as a police officer. Um, I do not like Gary Green. Uh, is it sad? No, his life. Who, who likes him? Who, his life and, and, and where things ended up. Sure. Obviously. Do we wish that it could have been prevented? Definitely. Am I going to uh, lose a single ounce of sleep? Once this man has uh, whatever cocktail injected in him, that's going to end his life. No, I am not. Um, I don't think he deserves to be around after what he did. I think he's a serial abuser and uh, a bad person. Yeah. Separate of his mental illness, he is a bad person. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said before, the only thing that makes me go, hmm, like, is the fact that there was just no early intervention whatsoever. And I, I can see the harmful effects of that. But there is no good reason for what he did yeah. at, at all. And, and do you believe he's where he deserves to be? Like, do you think he's the kind of person that would reoffend? Yes, he, he did. Yeah, I was going to he did. He kept getting away with it. He kept, I mean, he's had a history of abusing women. And I think that could speak to a, one of the diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder is risky behavior, risk-taking behavior. And certainly abusing women is part of that. No empathy. So it's... Honestly, weirdly enough, the biggest risk he took in all of this was not killing JT and Jarrett. That is so out of left field and uncharacteristic. Although maybe that's like the equivalent of him driving his ex to the hospital after doing what he did. Maybe that was like that same thing driving him to be like, you know what? Let me let these witnesses live. It, it, it's just I, I can't figure out why he didn't kill them. I'm obviously happy I, he I didn't, mean, I but think, it doesn't make any sense I, to me. I think a part of that is he's a man uh, teaching younger men a lesson. Um, making them strong in his twisted s somehow yeah sparing them passing on I, I don't want to say passing on his legacy just so to speak but just showing them like you know when people threaten to leave you this is what happens when women misbehave this is what happens 
now be a strong man and, you know, call 911 and take care of it. And, you know, that's it. Yeah, rub, rub some dirt in it. and. So, I mean, I I don't want to analyze this guy. <laughs> I've, I've just like, I, I can't. Yeah, you've been living with Gary Green for well over a oh month my at this God. point. Yeah, I'm, I'm over it. I'm over him. And I just, I really do wish the best for Jarrett and JT and Jasmine's families. Um, I, I, I hope you all find peace whatever that looks like for you yeah guys if maybe on the the next case that gets suggested we could try to stray away from child murder that would be great i i genuinely feel like <laughs> like almost three quarters of our episodes involve a child getting killed it's getting a little exhausting maybe maybe like a clown getting killed or just something completely left field just, some, just anything that's not child murder, please. I'm begging you at this point. But the origins of evil at gmail.com, that's where you can submit cases. That's the easiest way for us to keep track of it. You can always message us on Instagram or, or Facebook, but uh, I'm not always the best at answering those messages because of deep character flaws that I have that my wife points out often. Love you. Well, I think that's the end of this episode. I'm I'm relieved. I'm relieved to not have to discuss Mr. Green anymore. Yeah, it's getting late. I feel like I'm just like rambling now about yeah. how much I hate Gary Green. Well, maybe we'll do an update when they finally end his life. Yeah. That has to be soon-ish. Um, yeah, I have no idea how that works. Like how do they go about picking dates and stuff? So. Well, it's Taco Tuesday next week and... Don't want to muddy the mood that night. So, all right. So I think uh, I think that's it. Listen, if you could leave uh, reviews on whatever podcast platform you're on, uh, subscribe to our Instagram, uh, like things on YouTube or whatever. And uh, when you when when you do leave your very kind, very very generous review, where you praise the show for being innovative and all these things. Uh, my name is Paul and, uh, <laughs> my name is Megan. <laughs> yes. We got a lovely review that was so sweet. It really made our day. The person did <laughs> think Megan's name was Nicole. The, the first time I read Nicole, I thought that maybe it was just like a brain fart. Cause they must've just listened to the Nicole Vanderheiden episode. The second time I read Nicole, I was a little confused. <laughs> going to be honest. <laughs> I but, thought it was funny. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that has been another episode of The Origins of Evil. I'm Paul Braun. And I'm Megan Braun. And remember, murderites, never go to a second location. The Origins of Evil.